morning, everyone. Happy October. Happy Friday. Welcome you joining today's class, ADA Compliance and Disability Access Claims. I'm Pauline Lam from Cotai Realty, your 2021 co-chair, Education Committee, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. A friendly reminder, all participants will be muted in the meeting. Should you have any questions, please enter it into the chat box. So the speaker will answer your question during the Q&A section. This section is being recorded and will be available on the YouTube channel, West San Gabriel Valley Realtors. Now, I'm so glad to have our education committee member, Ms. Gon Narita Gonzalez, to introduce our very special speaker today, Cindy Noin. Now, take it away, Narita. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you so much. I'm excited here today to introduce Cindy Nguyen in the, as the managing partner at Amity Law Group. She has extensive experience in employment law and business litigation. Ms. Nguyen pro provides preventive counseling to employers regarding claims of discrimination, harassment, disability, um, accommodation, wage, and our um, our violations, ADA violations, misclassifications, and other alleged claims of employer misconduct. She represents employers in states and federal courts and before administrative agencies such as the California Division of Labor Standards Enforcement and the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. Now it's a lot, big words, right? <laughs> Ms. Wynn received her Juris Doctor's degree from Santa Clarita University of Law with a certificate in public interest and social justice law. She was the recipient of the Richard S. Rosenberg Award for Excellence in Labor Law and the Santa Clarita, Santa Clara, I'm sorry, I said Santa Clarita, I'm so sorry, it's Santa Clara University <laughs> School of Law. I put you in another school, Cindy, I'm sorry. <laughs> the Santa Clara University School of Law Pro Bono Bronze Award. That's fantastic. While attending law school, Ms. Swin <clears throat> interned at the United States Equal Op Employment Opportunity Commission her work at the EEOC involved investigating claims under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act, Equal Pay Act, Age Discrimination and Employment Act, and the Americans with Disability Act. Ms. Nguyen currently sits on the board of director of Rosemead Chamber of Commerce, Asian Business League of, of Southern California, and Asian Women in Business Southern California. I'm pleased to introduce Cindy take the floor. Good morning, everyone. Okay, so today, um, again, we're talking about ADA compliance and disability access claims. A little bit about the firm. So the class today is being presented by Amity Law Group LLP. We're based in Southern California with offices in Rosemead and Tustin. And although we're based in Southern California, we are um, able to assist uh, clients with needs all over California. And again, our practice uh, is focused on employment law, estate planning, and probate. We represent owners and employers in every aspect of employment law. And as you can see, we are Asian owned and women owned. I know we already had a little bit of an intro about me. So just to kind of um, go over it again, I am the managing partner. Uh, I went to UCLA from undergrad and then graduated Santa Clara uh, School of Law. I've been practicing for a little bit more than 12 years now, and um, I practice employment law and ADA. We focus on defense only, again, probate and estate planning as well. We are talking about Americans with Disabilities Act, disability access claims. So why do we care? Why do we care now? Well, the reason why we should care is that ADA lawsuits are on the rise. So it, once, ever since we started counting in 2013, um, where it really started gaining some traction here. California was in the lead at almost a thousand lawsuits that was filed in 2013, followed um, closely behind by Florida and then by New York with 125 in 2013. In 2017, the numbers nearly doubled. For California, it was 2,700, more than 2,700. At Florida, it was almost 1,500, and in New York, it was over 1,000. And then in 2020, we thought that we'd have a um, sort of a break here, but we didn't. We doubled again. Uh, and that was over 5,800 for California and 22, um, over 2,200 for New York and in Florida, a little bit over 1,200. 
Florida did see a little bit of a, a decline, a little bit of a break there. Lucky for them, not so lucky for us living in California where the cases continue to rise. And really there is no reason why it should slow down anytime soon. Um, and this is just the landscape. This is basically where we are um, and we, we need to figure out how to, how to deal with it. So um, in 2013, there were 2,700 filings for the entire year. So just again, to uh, put it into perspective of how much of an issue it's becoming now, in, 20, uh, in January, 2021, there were 1,100 cases filed in a single month which is pretty crazy. If you think about just in a single month alone, 1,100 ADA lawsuits were filed. The most uh, targeted areas, the most uh, the barriers that are most complained about in these lawsuits are accessible parking, exterior paths of travel, and that's the exit entrance, uh, restrooms, sales counters, and websites, of course. All right, so some of the common misconceptions here, um, as these lawsuits continue to arise, there's been a lot of uh, a rise as well as in misinformation. So one of the biggest misconceptions here is that all buildings that predate the ADA are exempt from accessibility requirements and are grandfathered in. So this is completely false. There's no such thing as being grandfathered into anything. If you are not in compliance, you're simply not in compliance and it does not matter how old your building is. Uh, there, there is a, um, we'll talk about this later, you know, the types of changes that you can make um, and it de depends on, you know, the cost to the building and um, what kind of um, burden it would create on the business owner and the landowners. So that's that's another type of analysis. But the idea that there is a grandfathered in is simply just not true. Even if you're really a, a really old building, um, but you could have put in some handrails on your um, uh, on your staircase, and and that's an easy fix and you didn't do it and you think that you didn't have to do it because the building is so old, well, that would be false. The second uh, mis misconception here is that only landlords are required to comply with ADA. That's also a false. So leaseors, leasees, renters, anybody who is operating a place of public accommodation would be required to comply with ADA. Now, as far as um, the parties contracting among themselves, uh, whose, uh, whose responsibility it would be between the landlord and the, uh, the tenant, that is a, a separate issue. So you guys can decide among yourselves, but the law still um, puts that burden on both of you. And then between the parties, you guys can you know, privately contract your, your own way of how you wanna deal with uh, the compliance there, but it still requires that both of you um, be in compliance. All right, so the third misconception, compliance is too expensive and burdensome. Again, um, handrails, things like that, uh, signage um, is not too expensive. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that can be done that would uh, easily put you in compliance without being too expensive or burdensome. Uh, next one is I've already been sued, so I don't need to worry. So that's another, no, that's not gonna work. That's not gonna fly. Um, you can be sued for the same violation. So you can be, and, and if you don't wanna be sued for the same violation um, by different people, by subsequent uh, uh, customers, then you got to fix it, get into compliance, and then you won't be sued. Um, next one is, it's not my fault. I didn't know. Well, um, same thing with uh, driving, you know, drunk. I didn't know. Well, <laughs> it doesn't fly. If you're drunk, you're drunk. Not knowing the law is never a good reason. Um, I will just ignore it. Also not a good way to handle um, any potential um, liabilities. And last one is my insurance provides coverage. 
So a lot of people think this is true, but I, uh, I've seen a lot of lawsuits. I've seen a lot of um, ADA lawsuits, and I have not seen a single carrier that will provide coverage for these types of violations. Now, if you've got um, an insurance carrier who will provide these types of uh, coverage, let me know. I've got, I got quite a few clients for that. All right, so the next thing is, uh, let's get into what is Americans with Disabilities Act? What is the Americans with Disabilities Act? What are the requirements? What is it? So the requirements for places of public accommodation is businesses and nonprofit organizations that serve the public must remove architectural barriers when it is readily achievable to do so, and when the barrier removal is easily accomplished and able to be carried out without much difficulty or expense. So the ADA is not trying to make business owners, uh, landowners, uh, not, it's not trying to make it more difficult or um, it's not trying to make it impossible. But where, what the ADA is simply trying to do is trying to accommodate to uh, certain sectors of the public who need these type of accommodations <laughs> that um, can be readily achievable. And so the, the law is asking the landowners, business owners to make these adjustments in order to accommodate this sector of the population. The decision of what is readily achievable is made considering the size, type, and overall finances of the public accommodation and the nature and the cost of the access improvements needed. So a lot of times clients will call me and ask, um, what is the potential exposure? What's the damage? What am I liable for? And without actually seeing anything about your restaurant, your store, without understanding your clientele, it's really impossible to tell you what the exposure is over the phone um, or when you come in and, and talk with, talk to me. It's, it's really difficult to tell you because, again, it, it's going to be dependent on um, the size, type, and overall finances of your, of your storefront, of your restaurant, of your location. All right, so what, what does a plaintiff must prove in order to prevail on a, an ADA lawsuit? So the three elements, and the first element is that uh, they must be, of course, disabled. Second element is that the defendant owns, leases, or operates. So it could be an owner, it could be a leaseor, or just somebody who's simply operating a place of public accommodation. And third uh, element is the defendant discriminated against the plaintiff under ADA. So this third element, the, the third one is, it's basically met if there's a violation of applicable accessibility standards. So let's go through each of the element and uh, try to understand it a little bit more here. So what is a disability? ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more of the major life activities of such an individual. So this includes people who have a record of such an impairment, even if they do not currently have a disability. So for example, a person who undergoes treatment for cancer then returns to work. Although the cancer may not be in remission, they have a record of having had it. It also includes individuals who do not have a disability, but are regarded as having a disability. So what does that mean? If you have an impairment that does not substantially limit a major life activity, you have an impairment that substantially limits a major life activity only as a result of the attitudes of others towards them, or you haven't, does not have any impairment, but is treated by an entity as having an impairment. The second element that a plaintiff must prove is that the place of a com uh, it must be a place of public accommodation. So ADA identifies 12 categories of facilities that are considered places of public accommodation for the purposes of ADA. Almost every public place that is open to the general public is basically included such as a bakery, grocery store, clothing store, hardware store, shopping center, 
or other sales or rental establishment. All right, so the third violation, the third element that a plaintiff must prove is that there was a violation of accessibility standards. Um, and this is determined by Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines. Um, and you can Google it and there's a, you can see the guidelines there. It contains technical requirements for accessibility to buildings by individuals. Common examples of readily achievable barrier removal required by the ADA include installing handicapped parking spaces, installing curb cuts in sidewalks, lowering dispensers in restrooms, installing grab bars in toilet stalls, installing ramps, rearranging tables, chairs, vending machines, display racks, and other furniture, repositioning telephones, adding raised markings on elevator control buttons. Um, that's like the braille markings, installing flashing alarm lights, widening doors and installing accessible door hardware with disabilities. So these are the um, uh, these are examples of what is considered as readily achievable um, that the ADA considers as something that um, is not burdensome, is not too expensive, and should be done if it can be done. Uh, again, based on your size, location, and, you know, your storefront, your general layout, these are the types of things that, that are. are um. So there's a question here, is the ADA requirement different for city, state, which is more strict? So no, um, ADA requirement is not different. Uh, it is a federal guideline. So the ADA is a federal law um, and is... Uh, so when you look up the Americans with Disabilities Act accessibility guidelines, it applies to um, the, the entire United States. Okay, so again, we talked about how ADA lawsuits are on the rise um, and the targeted areas of accessibility are accessible parking, exterior, pa exterior paths of travel, restrooms, sales counters, and websites. So we're gonna go through each of these and try to um, address how to mitigate uh, these, these highly uh, targeted barriers. So parking, um, big surprise that the parking is targeted. Not really because it is, uh, it's just the easiest thing for a plaintiff to file a complaint about. They don't even need to go into your store to see that there's a violation. Uh, they don't need to go into your building to realize that there's a violation. Um, they simply just need to pull up into the parking lot and, and see that there's not um, the, the right number of um, accessible parking spaces. So accessible parking spaces are required for each parking facility on a site. Um, it applies equally to public employee or restricted parking. And at least one of every six accessible spaces or fraction of six in each parking facility must be sized to accommodate vans. So the location, it must be located on the shortest accessible route to an accessible entrance. Where do you put an accessible parking? Again, must be located on the shortest accessible route to an accessible entrance. Identification, it needs to be identified. Um, accessible spaces must be identified by signs with the international symbol of accessibility. So you can see there's an example there, reserve parking. That's, that's a sign, um, a, a sample of a sign that would be uh, required for uh, an accessible parking space. Signs identifying van spaces must include the term van accessible. And signs should be mounted so that the lower edge of the sign is at least five feet above the ground. So these are just uh, some very, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, sampling of what is required for accessible parking. There's a lot of technical requirements and I do encourage you to um, review those uh, requirements in the guidelines. All right, so, um, Exterior paths of travel. So again, this is the exit and entrance points of any building. 
Um, barriers such as steps and no landing at the door makes it impossible for persons with disabilities to enter. A solution is to include a ramp, an elevator, platform lift, another entrance, buzzer for assistance at the door. So this is um, a pretty um, common storefront that has a little bit of a step. And this would be, this is in violation here. Um, an easy fix would be a ramp, a, a small ramp. Um, so, but if all else fails and compliance is technically infeasible, providing assistance to persons with disabilities may be considered acceptable. For example, providing a sign up front um, that's clearly stated, we're pleased to provide assistance to anyone requesting it and ring the bell if you need that assistance. The next um, hot topic is uh, that's highly targeted is restrooms, of course. Um, the toilet seat here must be 17 to 19 inches above the floor. Sink must be 34 inches off the ground with room for knees underneath. Grab bars must be between 34 and 38 inches off the ground. A clear floor space of at least 60 inches around the sidewall and 56 inches from the rear wall to allow wheelchair access. Cell scanner. Um, cell scanner is also targeted as well. So um, make sure that your cell scanner is at least 36 inches long and a maximum of 36, 36 inches off the floor. So 36, 36 is the number you want to remember. The area must also have an accessible route to all entrances and other areas of the business where goods are sold, are sold or services are provided. An auxiliary table or desk can be used um, as a substitute if no accessible counter is available. So you can, if this isn't possible, you can do like a side table that's shorter um, and accessible for someone who is in a wheelchair. All right, the last uh, targeted area, and we're seeing a lot of increase in this, in this area, a lot of activity is websites. Uh, everyone's got a website these days. And um, question is, does ADA applies to websites? So the courts have been divided on this. There's no clear answer, um, but it doesn't stop plaintiffs from filing lawsuits for websites and claiming that websites are not accessible uh, to, uh, to, to certain um, people there. Um, is ADA, does the ADA apply, does it apply to businesses operating purely online without a physical location? And again, this is um, also not clear with the courts. This is uh, still, although it has been happening for quite some time now where lawsuits are being filed for websites, um, it's, it's still not, uh, not law that we know to be confirmed yet. Uh, courts are still sort of all over the place. Certain courts say yes, certain courts say no. Um, so we, in order to move forward, should safely assume that it does so that we're not caught in the, in the, in the crosshair here. Guidelines on how to make a web page more accessible to people with disabilities is um, the Website Content Accessibility Guidelines version 2.0, published by the Web Content Accessibility Initiative of the World Wide Web Consortium. And this guideline outlines four principles. Uh, number one, that it is perceivable. Number two, operable. Number three, understandable. And number four, robust. So we're going to take each of these um, principles and try to understand them a little bit better here. So examples of a website to be perceivable is that um, you provide text alternatives for non-text content. You provide captions and other alternatives for multimedia. Number three, create content that can be presented in different ways, including by assistive technologies without losing meaning. Make it easier for users to see and hear content. Um, some, examples, some examples of this is provide captions for videos with audio and alternatives to vi video only and audio only content. Provide ability to resize text to at least 200%. 
provide sign language translations for videos, make audio clear for listeners to hear by eliminating background audio, and enable user to modify font size, foreground, and background color. The next, exact, the next one is operable, making sure that your website is operable. So how do we do that? Make all functionality available from a keyboard. Give users enough time to read content. And avoid any content that flashes more than three times per second. That has um, been known to cause seizures if it's more than three times per second. Understandable. How do we make our websites understandable? So you can make text readable and understandable, make content appear and operate in predictable ways and help users avoid, avoid or correct mistakes. So such as using icons and buttons consistently, um, explain any abbreviations that you use on the website, explain words that are hard to pronounce, and provide help and detailed instructions. All right, the last uh, principle is making sure that the website is robust. So you wanna maximize uh, the capability with uh, current and future user tools, including assistive technologies, ensure user agents can accurately interpret and recognize content, requires that the coding is accurate, elements have complete and start and end tags, Pages are designed so that they can be viewed by the user's web browser and operating system settings. And consider adding PDF versions of information contained on websites, allowing users to zoom in on content for easy reading. All right, um, so some defenses to uh, ADA lawsuits. All right, so this is a case that was uh, pretty recent. It was filed in California in 2020. This is Whitaker versus Tesla Motors, Inc. Whitaker is what you would call a, um, uh, basically a, plain, uh, a plaintiff who goes around suing everyone. So I, I also had a Whitaker case. Um, a plaintiff uh, defended a case where Whitaker was also the plaintiff. And here Whitaker decided to sue Tesla Motors. Plaintiff visited a Tesla dealership and alleged its service counters denied him full and equal access. So again, this is service counters. That was um, part of the very, uh, very much targeted areas of a, of a building or a store. He further alleged that Tesla's failure to provide accessible service counters prevented him from returning to the dealership. So Tesla argued that plaintiff failed to plead facts as set forth in prior cases. Specifically, he did not allege how the service counters prevented him from access and which counters were non-compliant. So if you guys have, if anyone has ever been into a Tesla store, um, they do have counters, but they also have people walking around offering uh, assistance and help. So although there is a counter, but that counter is actually not where they do you know, exclusive business. So here the court agreed to Tesla and say that plaintiff had failed to explain how the service counters denied him full and equal access. So um, if you want to avoid any kind of counter claims of service counters, um, have your, your sales rep, have your people go beyond the sales counter and um, engage with customers so that there is no... Uh, Potential issue about the sales counter. Okay, so um, certified access specialists. So what is that? They are um, expert in construction related accessibility and they provide site surveys. So this is a really good idea to have to hire a certified access specialist and to get a report. Um, they will provide detailed report listings uh, on any accessibility findings. They will take pictures of all the accessibility findings and they'll actually advise you on how to correct their findings. A, um, they'll provide a numbered uh, CASP certificate issued by the California Division of State Architects. Costs approximately 800 to $2,000, but it's well worth it because you'll be able to avoid litigation by proactively curing any accessibility issues. Upon completion of inspection, you are then a qualified defendant 
which means that if you are sued after the report is issued, the statutory damages are reduced from 4,000 to 1,000 for each instance of violation. But you must show that all construction related violations were corrected within 60 days of being served with the complaint. Uh, also, I just wanted to throw this out here that there are tax incentives for improving accessibility and removing barriers. A lot of people don't remember this, but um, the I, there's the IRC section 44 that allows tax credits for up to 5,000 a year for businesses with less than a million to, in revenue and less than 30 full-time employees. So this is again, a tax credit. Um, the government's gonna give you money and not a tax deduction, but a tax credit for up to $5,000 on making accessibility improvements to your business. The second uh, tax incentive or tax uh, benefit is that IRC section 190 allows tax deduction of up to $15,000 a year for all businesses. It uh, doesn't matter if you make more than a million a year or have more than 30 full-time full employees. If you're considering doing any sort of major construction renovation to the premises, um, make sure that you uh, include that in your uh, returns the tax credit or the tax deduction. And something really nice to point out to clients who are um, looking to buy or looking to rent spaces that are not currently in, compliant, in compliance, but uh, can be uh, on the cheap. Okay, so here you are, you're, you were served with an ADA complaint, now what? So settlements usually occur before submitting an answer to the lawsuit. Uh, parties will agree to extend time to respond to the complaint to allow parties to discuss <laughs> settlement. Litigation is not preferred even if you may prevail. So this is really uh, standard, really typical that uh, happens with ADA lawsuits, plaintiffs, all plaintiffs. They, it, it is a numbers game for these type of lawsuits. Um, they just wanna file as many complaints as possible and settle as many as possible as quickly as possible. This is not, you know, dig your shoes in and continue for the long ride and try to hold out for more and more money. That's not this type of lawsuit. Uh, these plaintiffs know that they're just going to do as little work as possible and try to um, settle with uh, as quick as possible. So plaintiffs know this, defendants don't know this because they're usually, this is like the first time they've been sued. Maybe they've only heard of other people being sued, but that's what happens uh, when you hire an attorney, they're gonna tell you the same thing. Um, trying to drag the lawsuit out is just going to hurt you because you're just gonna pay more and, and attorney fees rather than just uh, saving that money and putting it towards the settlement. All right, um, ADA damages. So the damages that are available to a plaintiff in these type of lawsuits are damages, um, are actual damages. So again, minimum is 4,000. Injunctive relief, reasonable attorney fees, and litigation expenses also expert witness fees. So this, the attorney fees, that's where the bulk of these um, settlements are going to be about. Um, not so much the uh, statutory fee of 4,000 or the 1,000 if you've had a CAFS report, um, that's going to be the attorney fees. And that's why there's no, there's no point in delaying settlement. Um, at, you know, you're building every building. It's sort of like driving, um, driving down the street. If a cop follows you long enough, they will catch you in some kind of violation. <laughs> you didn't stop at a stop for the required amount of time. So same thing with a building. The longer they look at your store, at your building, at your restaurant, um, they will find a violation. Uh, that's just uh, the sad truth of it is that is there's so many um, requirements for a building to have in order to be in compliance. 
So, um, you know, it's just the, the numbers are there that are against you because there's so many requirements, it's likely that you're going to be in violation. Um, and because there's going to be any kind of violation, even if it was just one violation, the amount of attorney fees will, will trump that violation. And that's what people care about is the actual uh, recuperation of the award of attorney fees. So the settlement amount depends on plaintiff's firm and type of defendant. And this is just the honest truth. Um, plaintiff's firm, if it's a, a Whitaker firm, uh, someone who is representing Whitaker and he's got the same person, I believe it's Potter Handy, um, they are going to uh, shoot for anywhere between 18 and 20,000. And that's just because, how do I know that? Because I, I have experience. Um, with that kind of firm. It's just their reputation and um, what we defense attorneys know about them. Okay. And same thing with a, you know, if it's a smaller firm that hasn't been doing this as much, then they'll accept something less. Settlement includes monetary payment and barrier removal. And to prevent future lawsuits by different plaintiffs, businesses must focus on the barrier removal. Again, you don't want to have these $20,000 lawsuits uh, every other month. Just try to make those changes and then you can sleep uh, peacefully at night. <laughs> okay, so examples of real life settlements. So here it is. Um, I had a defendant, I uh, represented a prolific nail salon and the landlord. And with the, in this case, the nail salon and the landlord, they did have a, uh, the lease did, you know, contract where the nail salon, the, uh, the tenant would take care of um, these type of violations. So, um, and also, you know, it really kind of depends on the tenant landlord relationship. This scenario, the tenant really wanted to keep their landlord happy. They were happy in their place, in their um, location, did not want to upset the landlord. So said, you know what, we're going to take care of the legal fees and the settlement. So that's what they worked out. Plaintiff was a quadriplegic and alleged sales counter violation. Um, the plaintiff's attorney was Potter Handy, and our this global settlement was for twelve thousand. So we were able to actually settle for a little bit less than what they the average that um, Potter Handy Potter Handy usually accepts. Um, so that was that was a good one. The next one is um, so the defendant was a restaurant with multiple locations. Um, and then the landlord was also sued. So in all of these ADA lawsuits, the landlord is always uh, is always uh, sued as well, as well as the business establishment that is operating on the site. Plaintiff alleged parking and pass of travel violation. So this is parking and pass of travel. So like the you know how to get into the store, the path of the. Uh, uh, of getting into the store. Signs were missing and were posted too low. Uh, designated parking was not sufficiently painted. So again, the parking is just so easy. So they just throw it in, why not, right? It, the paint is uh, has been, um, was fainting. So of course, throw that in. So plaintiff's attorney here was Kevin Hong. Uh, from Advanced Disability Advocates, and we were able to settle that for $27.50. So I don't mind blasting these plaintiff's attorneys because uh, it's just a lot of these complaints are really very, um, very hollow, and um, there's just not a lot of thought into these complaints. A lot of these complaints are even, uh, you, you can kind of see that it wasn't even uh, the right location. But at the same time, you know, there's no reason, there's no need to argue that it wasn't the right location because you know your location, you know your client's location probably has violations. So instead of pointing out, wait, this isn't the right location, your complaint 
um, is actually talking about another location. But if you point them to the right location and then they realize there was actually more violations, then you've actually just shot yourself in the foot. So instead, if you can get out for less than 3000, take it. And then I'll obviously make those adjustments. Okay, uh, and then the last example uh, of a real life settlement here was the defendant was a restaurant with multiple locations. Again, restaurants are very, very popular in, for these type of lawsuits. Plaintiff alleged the, uh, that there was a website violation. It was a skeleton of a website. The restaurant wasn't really using the website, but it was a domain and it actually had, it had an outdated version of a menu. And that was it. There's nothing else on the website, but they wanted to keep the website. They wanted to use, keep the domain just in case they did want to expand on the website. So here our plaintiff's attorney was Manning Law. Manning Law is also pretty popular in this, in this arena. Um, and we were able to settle this for 4,000. All right, so I hope that was helpful. That is the end of um, my slides, my presentation here. Uh, Wanted to make sure you guys had some real life scenarios to uh, draw from. And that's, that's, that's all I have. That was a great presentation. Do you mind if I read uh, a question from Frankie Ho? Sure. Absolutely. He asked, as a landlord, I am required to install the handrail, am I required, sorry, to install the handrail from front yard to the front door of the building? And there's three steps from the lawn to the front door. And he says, it's a, I asked him what type of building is. And he says, it's a two unit with, it's one story and there's two units. So handrails are really, really good. Uh, if there's a place for a handrail, thumbs up. <laughs> yes. Are you, as a landlord, are you required? You know, that's, again, that's between you and the tenant. You guys can contract as to who is going to accept liability and who's going to accept the, um, the expense and the burden of putting in the handrail. Um, you guys can decide upon that. But again, if you're sued, if that building, if that uh, store, that, you know, whatever is, is sued, then both of you are going to be liable for that. Why does it sound, I get the impression, it's just cheaper to fix it. <laughs> It really is. It honestly is just cheaper to fix it. Um, another question, and we have a question from uh, Wei Meng Li. How does the plaintiff lawyer assign a claim value to the amount of damage besides your wit taker example, usual range, that a disabled person may been um, entitled to? Entitled to. What is your defense strategy? Will installing the necessary purported items take care of the lawsuit without paying the fines or their legal expenses should we settle out of court good example shared thank you okay so that's a lot of questions and see how does the plaintiff lawyer <laughs> assign a claim value okay so a lot of times claim values are assigned based on the um how much is it going to cost to uh try the case mm -hmm. and so how can we get to a number without spending so much money? So that's basically that, that usually that number will usually land somewhere in the uh, 15 to $20,000 range. And that's just basically with any kind of lawsuit where, you know, you're going to ask for something that um, someone's going to accept and they know that it's, it's, it's small enough for them to uh, consider, but not too large where they'll say, I'm just going to file BK. No one's gonna file BK over $20,000. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, it, it's just a numbers game where they're thinking, okay, what are we, where can we land where we're not being too greedy, where someone's going to just not want to negotiate at all uh, if it's too high. And if it's too low, then you're leaving money on the table because you know that the defendant will ultimately have to hire an attorney and they don't want to be spending too much money on the attorney. You want to allow money for the settlement itself. But the more you spend on your attorney, the more you realize that you're going to need to just 
uh, try and settle. So there's really, there, it's not a, uh, there's no formula to this as to the value that's going to, uh, that your case is going to command. It's going to be based on the, again, the plaintiff's firm, their reputation, their historical wins, what they can get from these type of claims, and based on you, who you are. If you are a defendant that has very deep pockets, if you're a defendant with many store locations, storefronts. So those are really the only two real factors that people are looking for as to where you land on the $20,000 to $15,000 scale. Okay. What are your defense strategies? Uh, defense strategies? There's honestly not too many. We do talk about, um, you know, the, the CASP. Uh, reports, uh, getting clients to get those reports, even after you've been sued, you want to get that report just to show that you've, you're, you're doing your due diligence. Um, other strategies is that, you know, it's actually, we try to tell them, hey, you know, the day that you came to see it, it actually, you know, shortly after there have been improvements and modifications from the day that you visited. Um, and, uh, and, and just honestly, just trying to get in early on settling the matter, because once plaintiff has put in some time in litigating the case, then they won't be able, they won't be as amenable to a discount. And what about coming in compliance with the lawsuit? Um, will you still have to pay the fines and their legal expenses? So, uh, if you've installed it prior to the lawsuit, then you won't be sued. But if you installed it after the lawsuit, it's still a violation. So you've already been sued, great that you've fixed it, but yes, you're still gonna be liable to the their demands and their legal expenses, yes. And re do you recommend settling out of court? Always. So all of these cases are always settled out of court. And what about real estate home offices? Real estate home offices. Yes. Are they, a, a, can, can a realtor, I guess the question is, can a realtor be sued uh, because their home, home office is not ADA compliant? No. So your home office is not considered a public place of accommodation because it's a private home residence. If you're running a business out of it, uh, you know that might start to look like a place of public accommodation. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on who you are inviting to your home <laughs> and making sure that you can accommodate those who are not able to come or not able to assess, access it as easily. It sounds like on that one, best practices keep meeting them at the coffee bar. <laughs> yeah. Put it on the coffee bar <laughs> of responsibility Starbucks, and make it accessible. <laughs> um, your private home, you don't want that to uh, open that up to, to ADA compliance. And I personally have a question regarding the websites. Um, you know how you can go online, you already get those templates that are online. There's three or four different ones. Now, are those already in compliance with the ADA? No, not necessarily. Okay. So unless they tell you that they are ADA compliance, then no, not necessarily. So there are a lot of people out there now that specialize in making websites ADA compliant. Um, and, you know, they can provide uh, more detailed information as to how to make those websites uh, compliant. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. That was amazing. I learned a lot, got a lot of great information. I don't have any more. Oh, I do have one more question just popped up. Um, I need some engineers who can draw the structural engineering plan before we can comply to ADA. Do you have any referrals? Okay. Uh, I don't have uh, any structural engineers referrals, although I can probably bet you that the CAS people would know people, uh, would know the structural engineers. So that's a really good place. Um, there's, if you just Google K, uh, C A S P um, ADA, and there'll be plenty of people who 
uh, offer those services, the, the reporting services. And those are the people that you want to ask referrals for engineers, structural engineers, or people who can draw plans and make the ADA compliance. Okay, I'll put that to everyone. Uh, C-A-S-P-A-D-A, -A right? Yeah. Okay, so I put that in the chat box. Well, thank you so much, Cindy. That's it from the questions. I thought it was amazing. I learned a lot today and I will give the floor back over to Pauline. Thank you. Thank you, Cindy and Narita for this wonderful section. You all agree with me, we do learn a lot today about ADA compliance and disability access claims. And thanks for those uh, case study case. It's wonderful, we do learn a lot. If you want to sleep peaceful at night, um, for further questions, please contact Cindy directly. <laughs> On behalf yes. of West and Gibbel Valley Realtors, we truly appreciate and want to thank again, Cindy Noing, Amy T. Law Group, in Rosemead. And uh, we hope to see you soon in person. A quick reminder, uh, new RPA form will be applied uh, formally. A tentative schedule is the second week of December. And St. Gabriel Board uh, invite Gough Hutchinson to conduct a four hour uh, class, especially for West St. Gabriel Valley Realtors and the fellow realtor around the area. The class is November 2nd, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. It is a paid class, but we do give uh, uh, everyone the best price in town. And register at wsgvar.com. Choose education, education schedule to enroll it. The deadline enroll is October 28th, next Thursday at 3 p.m. because Fong gonna to uh, email all the registrants uh, information to CAR to give us the link to check in and don't miss out this convenient and good schedule for all the realtor uh, nearby the area. November 2nd, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. And that another two good class provided by Addison is next Monday. If you want to be certified green lending, professional training class hosted by Addison next Monday, 9 to 1 p.m. and next Wednesday, 9 to 1 p.m. ADU class. And all come to wsgvar.com's website, education, education schedule. I want to thank again, Cindy, Narita, Fong, and all of you joining today's wonderful class. And we see you soon.